All right, I have a confession to make. I'm trained as a geneticist and a classical pianist, but I'm a bowerbird wannabe. And today I'm going to tell you the story of how I became more effective as a teacher. And in order to do this, I had to step out of my comfort zone and, and discipline as a scientist into other disciplines to learn how to empower my students to be more creative and take more risks. I've been teaching biology at liberal arts colleges for 15 years, and I thought I was a great teacher. I always had excellent student evaluations, my courses were always over-enrolled, and every year I turned down students from my research lab. But I always wondered, am I being effective at teaching, and how would I know? Are my students learning the four C's, critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration? Unfortunately, the evidence was not supporting this hypothesis. Students weren't asking me questions in my courses based on creativity and curiosity. They were asking me questions like, do I need to know this for the test? And then after the test, they would say, but professor, I studied so hard. I knew the material so well, right? Does this sound familiar? Well. Uh, my field of biology that I study in my research is called Evolutionary Developmental Biology, or EVO-DEVO. And EVO-DEVO is a field in which we study how, during the development of an organism, over evolutionary time, things have changed in order to give us the diversity of animals we see on the planet today. And what I realized is that in order for me to become more effective as a teacher, I was going to have to evolve and develop an EVO-DEVO my own teaching. Now, my inspiration came to me quite suddenly. It's one of those things. I was with my family, and we were camping in Kakadu National Park, which is a really remote region in the Northern Territory of Australia. And right outside of our campsite was this incredible structure we found on the ground. This is the bower of the great Northern Bower Bird. And um, it's about a foot and a half to two feet in length. It's about a foot high, and the male bird builds this bower in order to attract a female. So he has to build the most beautiful, impressive bower in order to get a female into his uh, little den there. Um, and what's remarkable that I learned is that the bower bird isn't born with the ability to do this. Juvenile male birds go out and apprentice under an adult male and they watch the adult male build and rebuild his own bower. And then they go find a site and build their own. It takes a bird six years to build a structure like this. And he not only builds it twig by twig, these are thousands of twigs carefully assembled to form this uh, stereotypical shape, but he also decorates it to make it attractive. So in this bird, uh, chose white pebbles and shells that he found and put them on the entryway. The entryway is flanked with green leaves and broken beer bottles. <laughs> and then on the sides are some dry red fruit. And so he's trying to make this as attractive as possible. And I was just so struck by the ingenuity this bird showed in building the structure. The bird's ability not only to build it, but to prototype and rebuild and the communication skills required to do this. And I thought, oh my goodness, could my students do this? And I knew that they couldn't. <laughs> I realized that my students couldn't do this in part because I had actually never asked them to. And that was rather sad for me. So I asked, how could I make my students more like a bowerbird? And I realized that I was going to have to take more risks. So I went to the literature, and I read all about how helicopter parenting is having the effect on kids that they're no longer creative and they're no longer willing to take risks. Um, I learned from Julie Lifcoat Hames the, the importance of struggle, that kids need the space to struggle through problems on their own in order to learn problem solving and confidence in their ability. So I asked, are my students struggling in my courses? And of course they were struggling in my courses. My courses are really hard. Ask any of my students. But 
to be honest, they were hard because I made the content hard, not because I was teaching my students how to become independent thinkers, to be creative, to take risks. Angela Duckworth talks about grit, and she says that grit Living, uh, grit is like living your life like a marathon, not a sprint. And my courses were definitive sprints through content, through textbooks. And I realized, with the inspiration of that Bauer and the Bauer Bird, that something was going to have to change. And the Bauer Bird himself is a 21st century thinker, right? He's, he's displaying all those elements that we value so much right now. So, how was I going to turn my students into bowerbirds? And how was I going to turn my students into 21st century scientists? To do this, I was going to have to evolve myself and to find new directions. So, whenever I have a problem as a scientist, I always approach it by the scientific method. And here's sort of my version of scientific method. I first start off with a question, something I'm curious about that I want to answer. And I design experiments to answer that question, address the question in some way. I then collect my data and analyze it. And I ask, is the data that I've collected answering the question I've asked? And 90% of the time, it doesn't. So I have to go back, and I have to redesign my experiments, and repeat them, and modify them. And it's a lot like the Bauer bird building his bower. Ultimately, I have a data set that answers my question, and it only leads me to the next question. And so this is very cyclical cycle in science. So I decided to adapt this process to designing my courses, and I threw every syllabus I had away. I threw from intro bio all the way to my senior seminar. And here's my course design process now. I start off with a question, some big question that no student could answer immediately. For example, in intro bio, I ask my students, in the movie The Martian, what were the biological concepts that Matt Damon needed to understand in order to survive on Mars? Right? Something that you can't answer right away. I then ask my students on a weekly basis to write and reflect the material we're discussing to take some risk with that material, to come up with new ideas, to synthesize. I also have them on a weekly basis share their writing and their ideas with their classmates. They have to give each other feedback, and then students have to revise their ideas in writing. So this happens every week, that they're constantly collaborating and communicating new ideas. And finally, at the final assessment of the course, I ask them to answer that essential question that we posed at the beginning of the course. The most important aspect of this design process is in how it's assessed. I do not grade students for having great ideas in their weekly reflections. They can be wrong ideas. I don't really care. The most important thing is I give them credit for collaborating, for communicating, and for taking the risk of coming up with new ideas. And that's how I promote risk and confidence in my students. This really works. Students no longer ask me in my classes, do I need to know this for the test? Because they've bought into the learning process, um, and they understand how the material is completely integrated. All right, so as a scientist, I decide to collect data on my new um, my new experimentation. And uh, I found that 80% of the students in surveys comment that it's easier for them to write and that they felt their writing improved over time. 85% said that it was easier for them to come up with new ideas and organize their thoughts. And 85% said it was easier to integrate the material in the courses and with the readings. So you think this was a win, right? But was I really promoting creativity? And was I really pushing students outside their comfort zone to take risks? I wasn't sure yet. So I decided to take some risks myself and step out of my comfort zone. And I went back to the land of the Bowerbird, back to Australia. And I directed a term abroad. And I had a co-director in the classics department. And instead of teaching a science course, we co-taught a course called Food, Culture, and the Land. Instead of doing science experiments with students, 
we published an online news site that the students called the Whoop Whoop Weekly. The idea here was to get the students to explore their environments and to take risks and push them outside of their comfort zone. Through the um, different sections of the news site, students had to report on top news, they had to do book and media reviews, arts and culture, food and land, and uh, the Humans of Queensland section, which was a spin-off of the Humans of New York series. <laughs> In the Humans of Queensland section, there it is, um, students had to go out, meet people they didn't know, introduce themselves, ask to take their picture, get their personal story, and then write and publish it. And this became the most popular section of our paper. Students actually were really excited to rotate through this section and would ask to rotate a second time through. And the articles themselves were really diverse. So at the end of the course, I asked them, because I wanted some feedback, what was the most challenging aspect of this assignment? And there were two that came to the top. The first was integrating course material, which I sort of expected. But the second one, which is equally as challenging but not expected to me, was talking to people I didn't know. And then in a follow-up question, 65% of the students in the class said, with each week, it became too easier to talk to people I didn't know. And I finally felt like I had gotten it that students were recognizing the challenge of going out in the world and talking to people they didn't know, but were equally feeling like they had overcome that challenge and that risk and were feeling more confident in their abilities. I too was feeling more confident. <laughs> I had not only turned from a scientist, but then I had been a publisher, publishing the Whoop Whoop Weekly. And I decided when I returned back to the US to push myself even farther and I co-taught a course with an artist, and it was a bio-art class. Okay. And in the bio-art class, um, this was to address another nagging question I had from students. So in a lab course, when students look down the microscope, they always ask, always, what am I looking for? Right? And I had to sort of nip this one. The power of observation is really critical to being a good scientist. And the best way to address this is through transdisciplinary work where you're combining the sciences with the arts to develop those really keen observation skills. As a scientist during this course, I took the art section, and this is a picture from my sketch pad. These are gesture drawings of seashells. And these are my special contour and shading drawings. And you can see it. I'm pretty bad <laughs> as an artist. <laughs> I should definitely stick to science. But, um, but this is especially bad when you compare me to my science students in the course who drew these gorgeous images. Okay. Even though I wasn't very good as a scientist, I had learned something more about observation that I hadn't learned as just being a scientist alone. So, <laughs> I now wear many hats. I Evo V Devo to my teaching as a scientist, a publisher. The artist part is a little bit questionable. Um, but I think that it's really important to take transdisciplinary approaches to ask and answer big, messy problems we have in the world. All educators should consider how they can be more like the bowerbird. The bowerbird, of course, being a metaphor for 21st century thinking. The fight against climate change, um, scientific facts, and fake news is not going to be won by people who ask, what am I looking for, and is it going to be on the test? This fight is going to be won by people who can make keen observations, communicate and describe those observations through words and media, and who can take the risk to come up with really creative solutions to these big, messy problems. Thank you. <laughs>